Endometriosis is a condition where the endometrium, which is normally found inside the uterus, grows outside of the uterus, such as the surface of the uterus itself, the oviducts, the peritoneum, the ovaries, the urinary bladder, rectum, and even the stomach, to name a few of where this ectopic endometrial tissue can grow. Roughly 10% of women between the ages of 15 and 44 are affected. The ectopic endometrial tissue will respond to the ovarian hormones of the menstrual cycle, estrogen and progesterone. So as the endometrium within the uterus thickens, so will this ectopic endometrial tissue. And when menses occurs, where the endometrium is shed, well, the same thing will happen with this tissue. Unfortunately, it has nowhere to go. And this will result in intense menstrual pain, heavy bleeding. Sometimes the female may experience a long menstrual flow, pelvic pain, painful bowel movement, even painful urination, bloating, bleeding from the rectum, tiredness, and the cyclical pain that's associated around the time of menses that some females experience, such as pain in the lower back, the legs, the upper abdomen, and the chest. Unfortunately, 25 to 50 percent of females that have endometriosis will experience infertility. Occasionally, there may be spot bleeding between menses. Now, the exact cause is still unknown, but there are several possibilities. The first possibility is genetics. In other words, having a familial history of endometriosis or epigenetics. So some females that experience high or chronic stress may develop endometriosis. Retrograde menstruation is another possibility. This is where the endometrial tissue, the endometrium, leaves not only through the vagina, but it leaves through the infundibulum because we know that the infundibulum is an opening for the oocyte to enter the oviduct. Well, it also could be an opening for the endometrium to leave through that infundibulum. And now it can then transplant outside of the uterus, as you see with this image over here. The next possibility is direct transplantation. This is when the uterus experiences some type of trauma, such as a C-section, where sometimes the endometrium can detach from inside the uterus and then transfers to another site because of this uterine trauma. It can also be transferred to other organs with blood or lymph, and that's referred to as blood or lymph metastasis. The last possibility is transformation, also called metaplasia, where cells that are outside of the uterus literally transforms to become endometrial cells. Now, there are treatments involved with endometriosis. There are surgical options and non-surgical options. With surgical options, we can have excision. Through laparoscopic surgery, the endometrial tissue, the ectopic endometrial tissue, is removed or is excised. Another surgical option is endometrial ablation, whereby the endometrium is destroyed. The last surgical option is hysterectomy, the removal of the uterus itself. The non-surgical options involve hormone therapy, pain medication, stress management therapy such as yoga or meditation, and even physical therapy. As far as the stages of endometriosis, we can go from stage one, which is the least severe, to stage four, which is the most severe. And looking at some of these images, you can see some of the possibilities that can occur with endometriosis, such as the formation of adhesions. Adhesions are collagen fibers that anchor or bind organs together when normally they should be separated. For example, the ovary is bound now to the oviducts because of these adhesions, as well as the ovary being attached to the uterus. Another possibility is the formation of what's called an endometriotic cyst. This essentially is endometrial tissue that has formed around the ovary. And in fact, if we look at an actual female that has endometriosis, you can clearly see the ectopic endometrial tissue that has grown outside of 
the uterus. The last image are common sites where this endometrial tissue can transplant and grow. The vagina, commonly known as the birth canal, is a distentable or stretchable oblique muscular tube that's approximately three to four inches in length. So looking at the sagittal section, you can see how we find it along the oblique plane. It lies between the urinary bladder and as well as the rectum. It connects the vulva, the external genitalia of the female reproductive system, to the cervix of the uterus. It provides a passageway for the delivery of an infant, for menstrual flow, and as well as receiving the penis during sexual intercourse. And if the male ejaculates, it will hold the spermatozoa just before they enter the cervix. And during intercourse and childbirth, the vagina has the capability to stretch considerably. Now, in an adult female of reproductive age, the pH in the vagina is between 3.8 to 4.5, so it's an acidic environment. This will keep certain microorganisms at bay. The residential microorganisms, or bacteria, the lactose bacillus species, is responsible for creating this acidic environment. And what these lactobacilli will do is convert the glycogen, which is produced by the vagina's mucosal layer, to convert this glycogen to lactic acid. And this will prevent the growth of many opportunistic microorganisms that will take advantage if this pH were to increase such as Escherichia coli, which has been implicated in urinary tract infections, UTI, Candida albicans, that causes yeast infection, and as well as Gardnerella vaginalis, which is responsible for bacterial vaginosis. However, it does inhibit the motility and the viability of the spermatozoa. Now, the seminal fluid that is also ejaculated with the spermatozoa is basic. So they help neutralize the acidity. It turns out in pre-adolescent females and postmenopausal females, the pH tends to be higher. Therefore, these females are more predisposed to developing urinary tract infections or UTI, yeast infections, and as well as other infections of the vagina. It is because of the estrogen hormone that's either not yet at the concentration beginning at puberty, or a substantial decline in estrogen in postmenopausal females. And what this hormone does is it thickens this vaginal mucosal layer, and it maintains its thickness. This vaginal mucosal layer is what produces this polysaccharide, glycogen. And in turn, these lactobacilli will metabolize the glycogen, producing lactic acid. Now, if we look at the upper end of the vagina, it surrounds the cervix of the uterus and forms what's called the vaginal fornix or simply fornix. So it's found laterally, anteriorly, and posteriorly. And this is why sometimes... The fornix can be referred to as the lateral fornix. If we're looking at the coronal section, as you see over here, it can be referred to as the anterior, posterior fornix if we're looking at a sagittal section, as you see over here. So here's the posterior fornix, and here is the anterior fornix. A thin mucosal tissue can be found at the vaginal opening called the hymen. This hymen can vary in elasticity, shape, and thickness. Quickly looking at the top image of these different types of hymen, the most common type of hymen in found in most females is referred to as the annular hymen. So there is a little tiny opening that allows for menstrual flow. It could also be septated, it could be cribiform where you have these tiny little openings. After the first vaginal birth, the hymen is significantly stretched or torn. In rare instances, some females may have what's called an imperforate hymen, whereby there is no opening. So a minor surgery will have to be performed to create an opening allowing for menstrual flow. Now keep in mind, the hymen is not a reliable way to determine virginity because a female may have had the first sexual encounter, but the hymen has not yet torn. 
while in some females, they may have a torn hymen despite not having any sexual intercourse. More so if the female rides a bike or rides a horse, for example. That may be enough to tear the hymen. Now, if we look at the vaginal wall, what we find are many horizontal ridges or folds called rugi. And referring to the far upper right image, here are these rugi. And over here is an actual image of the wall of the vagina, clearly showing the many rugi. Not only does it allow for greater surface area for lubrication and as well as a habitat for these beneficial residential microorganisms such as the lactobacilli, but they may also allow for increased sexual stimulation of the penis. The vagina itself does not contain any glands. So the lubrication during sexual intercourse will be primarily provided by the cervical mucosa, the periurethral glands, and as well as the greater vestibular gland. They begin secretion upon sexual arousal. So the cervical mucosa, specifically at the layer of the lamina propria location, they secrete what's called transidate. Then the periurethral glands, also called the skein glands, that we find lateral to the opening of the urethra. So here is the opening of the periurethral glands. Remember, para means next to, urethra means urethra. While the greater vestibular glands, or the Bartholin's glands, they flank the vaginal orifice. These are the tiny little openings that allow for the secretion from these glands to enter the vagina. The layers of the vaginal wall consist of the innermost layer called the mucosa. And we have our epithelial tissue. This time it's non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium that directly faces the vaginal canal. It will form the rugi, which are again these foldings that we find along the outer surface of the vagina. And of course, we know that the stratified squamous epithelium will be anchored to the basement membrane and deep to that will be the lamina propria. Then we move to the middle layer, which is the muscularis. And this is the usual smooth muscle layer, we have the inner circularly arranged smooth muscle and the outer longitudinally arranged smooth muscle. It turns out this longitudinally arranged smooth muscle will continue on to form the myometrium of the uterus. And by having this rugi, sort of like an accordion, it can stretch the vagina, providing not only its stretchability, but its elasticity. Finally, the outermost layer is the adventitia. So this is where we find the connective tissue layer, and it consists of collagen and elastic fiber. So this is said to be a fibroelastic layer. Now, if you'll notice, there are no glands along the wall of the vagina. It needs to rely on the secretions of the cervical mucosa, the greater vestibular glands, and the paraurethral glands. So take a moment and look at the various images that I've included in this slide, which identify the different layers of the wall of the vagina.